want to introduce myself. My, my name is Danny Rogeri. I'm a faculty in the Department of Landscape, Architecture, and Spatial Planning. And I am going to talk to you about some of the theories. And I, I actually, it was really refreshing to see that some of the, the work that we do and the theories that we bring into the classroom actually resonate, are part of your daily work. And so it's very encouraging to see this. But I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the theories that guide our work uh, when we deal with sort of uh, socially sustainable uh, landscape development. And then um, just uh, introduce to you some of the practices that I've sort of uh, uncovered in my personal work and the work of friends that work in sort of uh, landscape architecture and uh, city development and city building. And then I'm going to use, I'm going to do some reflections, some tips. Uh, as a resident of Biorvika uh, and, and of Surenga in particular, I have uh, my own sort of understanding of what th things that work and maybe some suggestions as to so how things could change. Um, so I'm going to talk to you first about the theories, and I'm introducing this new, this term that you may have heard, uh, it's from the 1980s, but it's uh, uh, topophilia, which is essentially this love for place, or love for the landscape. But the starting point of our work is, of course, sustainability. It's the Brunland Commission uh, uh, product of Norway uh, in 1987. It set us on a trend, on a new path towards sustainable development. It told us that we needed to sort of live within the means that we had so that we couldn't compromise sort of the lives and the, the well-being of the future generations. It didn't really uh, t talk to us about, I mean, it did um, sort of, it was translated mostly in terms of energy efficiency, sustainable building construction, reduction of sort of uh, CO2 emission, and um, even in this uh, publication, in this kind of illustration from 1987, the same year, Richard Register at Berkeley, his representation of the sustainable city was a city that was essentially a city of buildings, just greener buildings, that, uh, sort of, and, and windmills and, um, capturing energy. Um, very little we know, and actually there's no people in the picture. And that's where I think uh, there's a little bit of work to do and uh, continues to be work. In fact, in 2000, uh, the, the uh, European, uh, the Council of Europe, uh, as Esteb has told us, actually, has reminded us of the importance of the social or the, the individual perspective in the context of sustainable development. And so they told us, for instance, that we need to define landscapes not just as sort of uh, material uh, culture or things that, we can, that can be certainly more efficient and used better, but also we need to look at them through the perspective and the lens of the experience of the people that live in them, that, uh, in have, that build their lives around them. So topophilia is really a concept, you can call it identity, uh, but it's this, uh, it speaks to us, it speaks to, to about this deep connection that people have with the landscape. We, the landscape defines us, and in return we sort of shape it. And so it's, a, it's sort of a cycle, that in this cycle we develop these strong bonds to a place. And most recently, um, there's uh, the term biophilia, has, been, um, has emerged in the planning literature. It's essentially telling us that not only uh, sort of cultural landscapes are important to the lives of people, not, the, not only the landscapes we shape and we live every day, but also the natural landscape. There is a deep emotional connection that we need to have, and we have, it's innate, but we need to sort of nurture with nature and with the natural processes. And of course, if you see the landscape through the lens of the individuals, then we need to see the landscape as a civil right. Access to the landscape is not something that we should, should be sort of limited to few people, the lucky people that live in Bjorvika or Sorenga, but it should be for all. And so the right to landscape is this concept that says, you know, the landscape is actually is a basic civil right. Uh, and we recently have a conference at NMBU that really discussed and try to uncover what are the challenges in dealing with the landscape as a civil right, as something that we, we, we owe to everybody. And my research has revolved a lot around this sort of interface between people, place, landscapes, and um, I called it identity. It's, I was really interested, I studied in the context of new towns, places like Björvika that were designed from scratch, that are now 56 years old, going back and actually looking at what is the identity that the landscapes that were designed, how, does it, how did this landscape actually resonate in the lives and, and the experience of the people that lived in them. And in sort of studying these places, I've uncovered that there's a lot more to identity than just the physical landscape. There's this emotional bond that individuals have with the place, 
And that is so almost sort of, it, 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 it's not a communal uh, sort of thing. It's a personal connection. It's based on your past experiences, on who you see yourself as an individual. But then there's, a, uh, there's social imageability, this concept that has to do with really the notion of community and how do communities actually, the values that communities share. Their relationship to the landscape, their identity is shaped by the words they use to describe who they are as a community. And also, satisfaction is a very basic element in most of the world. One way that people define identity is really by being satisfied with the place in which they live, let alone being excited or uh, sort of uh, thrilled by it. So these are some of the theories. And then these theories need to be somehow conjugated. They need to be translated into practices. And so I'm going to use the first part of my work uh, uh, the, uh, recently has been about sort of shifting away from sustainability and using instead the term livability, which essentially is looking at sustainability from the perspective of the individual. Sustainability doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things if it doesn't affect individual well-being and our lives, if it doesn't make our lives better. And um, so these are just some of the indicators that people like me focusing on livability have sort of uncovered that relate to the three sort of legged stool of the sustainability uh, agenda, economic, environmental, and social. And as you see, we know a lot more about the green, about the environmental, and, um, and we know a little bit about the blue, and we still kind of, and, and I think we need your, uh, your help, the, the help of the developing, uh, de developing com uh, community to really uncover what is livability from an economic standpoint. But, Here's some of the, so this is one of the principles. We need to start to think about livability as a basic human right and move away from sustainability towards livability. And of course, livability has to do with public health. And this is a picture of the, the floating sauna that's uh, floating on and off the uh, Sorenga, uh, depending on the time of the year. And it's a, it, it, to me, it's a sign that people seek opportunities for health, active and passive, Sauna, a sauna is one example of it. We need to provide these opportunities in the daily lives of people. It is integral to the livability and it's integral to achieving sustainability. And of course, this is an even crowded, more crowded beach at Surenga. Uh, we need to provide spaces so that everybody feels welcome in them. And they fit the places that fit a diversity of user groups. And I think Surga uh, does it really well. The beach does it really well. It's a place, if you go there, where there's dance, people dancing on the patio, kids playing in the water, families, single, single individuals, hipsters and non, all sort of gathering in one public space. That's a quintessential social arena. We need to do more with nature, I think. Nature as a viewing, as something that we view is important, but we need to put nature in touch or next to where people live in their daily lives. So in Portland, Oregon, which is a place that I, where I lived before I moved a year and a half ago to Oslo, we, uh, we are turning streets, or they are turning streets into actually living machines that capture the water from, that falls from the sky. There's a lot of water that falls there. Cleanse, cleanse it, and then bring it into the pipes. Only when it's cleaner, and, and of course they feed the aquifer, that way we don't uh, end up with over, uh, sort of uh, an overuse of the pipes or pipes that are not sized in, uh, well enough to accommodate all the heavy rainfall. We need to restore and reveal and celebrate nature. Nature is underneath us in some cases. And Spurn in Philadelphia talks about these creeks that have been covered up in the 1800s and now are sort of coming back. Cracks in the pipes are creating new trees. And so I think uh, the Midland, uh, 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 sorry for uh, the, the, that is not Rinaldi's Park in Los Angeles. <laughs> but I mean, this park reveals the natural history of Oslo, its original settlement, the reason why people actually settled in the city. And so we need more and more opportunities to bring back both the history of a place as well as sort of the, the nature that's lurking underneath the asphalt. And I think we need to understand more about um, uh, how people relate to place. So we need to sort of try to uncover what we called, some of us call the sacred structures of places. And these are not sacred in religious terms. These are sacred because of everyday activity, that everyday sort of, uh, you know, going to the store. Uh, to me, the Ku Prix in, uh, in, in Surenga is a sacred place. It's the place where I actually have most of my 
um, English slash uh, poor Norwegian conversations. But I mean, there's a lot of places like this, and this map is actually not from Oregon, but it's from uh, California, and it's the map of a 60-year-old lady that tells us that these hearts are really some, some of the everyday places that we all go to, but they're very important to every, every person, yet we rarely plan for them or um, uncover them as, as being important to people. And of course, this is from Bjorvika, and uh, these are the, we also need to provide places that allow us to interact with one another and interact with the landscape. And I think the community gardens there are a perfect example of it. In, in growing your own food, and in talking to your neighbor that grows maybe a different kind of uh, tomato, you engage in a dialogue that is at the foundation of identity. So this is what we call, this, the social psychologists called it uh, social interactivism. So essentially out of this interaction comes attachment to place and comes identity. And I think we need to promote, promote more participation. I am currently teaching a course, which is the, the Landscape Som Social Arena. It's a course that has been sort of revived after being sort of uh, mostly about sort of observing users in public space. This year, we really are teaching students how to in engage citizens, and particularly young citizens, through a collaboration with DOGA and the Barnet Rock uh, uh, project. We are actually engaging children in schools in Yiske, in Buda, in uh, Shi, to shape visions for their own communities. And this is in particular in, in uh, the students in Xi trying to deal and telling us about their feelings towards the density that's, com that's gonna come there because of the Follow um project. I think we need to rethink planning also, not as just master plans. We've, we've seen a lot of these master plans and I think they're really great, they're necessary. This is how we actually get things done. But we also need to start thinking of planning as a story to tell. Because it's true, Bjorvika is going to be done in 2030, but that story lives on. And so, for instance, this is a, a coloring book that I created in a community that I'm doing some work in in, in Italy. It's a very poor community uh, located between Milan and Bergamo. It's an immigrant community. And here we used storytelling as a way to educate the local kids about the history of this place, the ideals that were behind the construction of a new town, and then the challenges that they face every day as they try to become more sustainable. So if you could read Italian, you see that there, there's some messages built in. Some of them come from interviews we had with local residents, early residents. Some come from the marketing materials of the developer, and others come from the literature on sustainability. So landscape architects and planners and designers have a very uh, great role to play. And we can really leverage through aesthetics this kind of biophilia, this kind of attachment to place. And we can do it by just using simple uh, contrasting forms, for instance. And so when you juxtapose a green wall against the silhouette of the uh, Eiffel Tower, you create a contrast that will, will become memorable. People will carry uh, this image with them, and they, these places will become uh, sort of sacred places for these places. And, and I think you're doing just this in Bjorvika by contrasting the beauty of the fjord, the simplicity of the water of the fjord, with sort of the dramatic landscape of the, the opera. Their contrast is the, makes this place memorable. It's a place that every visitor to Oslo will carry. It, it's an image that they will carry with them. And it's part of the identity of this, of this city. But we need to do more, obviously, of this. And then I think we need to inspire all senses. And this is a, per, uh, it's, it's a great uh, project. It's in Providence, Rhode Island very degraded city up until the 80s, until uh, they decided to uncover a river that had been covered up and became a parking lot. And then they turn it into an event that happens all year round, uh, in winter and summer, that links music, fire, and water. And they even imported gondolas from Venice. That's a bit of a stretch. But I think it's an idea, it's the idea that the public spaces need to be somehow so to become stories to be told, they need to become events and rituals. And this is one way that you can create a ritual, and a ritual that engages all the senses. And I think Oslo is doing that too. And I think, you know, so Bjorvika can probably do some of that as well. Introduce maybe the element of fire in the cold uh, ice uh, winter of Norway, and then you have the perfect combination of a memorable experience that people will carry with, with them. And that's topophilia. And so then I'm going to reflect a little bit about some of the 
things I discussed, some of the theories, some of the practices that I have uncovered, they're incomplete, of course. And I sort of thought to look at my own neighborhood and see can I actually sort of, uh, can I suggest something that can move Surenga towards becoming more of a topophilic place. So a place where we can attach. And I think the first to me is put people first, not cars. Although we know, you know, the theories has told us it's so much better to be in bikes. This is just a comparison of the same street occupied by the same number of people, but in different kind of means of transportation. And you see it activates a whole lot of the public realm for new activities, for food, food carts, all these. And, and this is an image from Seattle. So in Surenga, uh, currently, we have a lot of parking underneath buildings. There's access to cars. And actually, reach, the reach is very close to the water edge. In fact, there's only a bar that separates cars from sort of uh, driving into the water. So how can we actually promote a different kind of experience, and a non-auto-oriented kind of experience? Perhaps moving parking to the edge within a five-minute radius of each home could be just as, uh, could still provide the convenience of having your car nearby, but then you would have to walk just like every urban resident in, in Oslo to your home, and that will free up then space for um, activities, uh, you know, a go-gate or a, a sort of shared street of sort, more bikes into Surega, perhaps a bike share station uh, could, be, could be good as well. And then perhaps by, by linking this parking, parking could be used by the neighbors in the surrounding neighborhoods, and that could become a more of a, a hub that then could be served by buses, and I know in the future it will be. But this is just kind of my idea of how we can move a little bit away uh, from cars and more towards uh, people in place. And so places have done it. The Vauban Eco District, which is a place where I take my students uh, from Oregon in the summertime, they're still coming this year. Uh, we look at this kind of eco district model, and it's a model that has decided really um, uh, abruptly to end the sort of uh, the supremacy of the car over people. And so cars are still allowed. You can still, and you pay a huge fee to have a car, just like you pay to park underneath your home in Surenga. But the space becomes activated then for all sorts of activities. Tip number two, strive to provide a true mix of urban uses. Having lived in Surga, I've experienced my 43 square meter apartment as sort of, uh, you know, as it's a good environment to sort of uh, grow as a single person. But I think if you want to bring more diversity into these neighborhoods, you need to start thinking about, and I think you have uh, to a certain extent thought about it, a diversity of housing types. Not only width and sort of square meters, but also actually the type of people that will live in them. And also we need to start to think about land use as not just a horizontal thing, not just a horizontal map, but as a vertical thing. So what's, what prevents us from having a doctor's office on the second floor of a building in Surenga? That would probably bring you know, a, a little bit of the public into, into the, your, the privacy of your building, but it creates these chance encounters. It will probably be good if you have a problem you know, one day or, or if I have to, you have to visit a doctor. Or uh, maybe assisted living. We need to start to rethink maybe housing as more of a life, uh, lifestyle and life and not just kind of house, not just housing. And so, and perhaps we need to think about affordability. I'm looking into buying a house in Surenga, and it's pr practically impossible for me to access it uh, on the salary of a first time amanuensis. So I think it's important to sort of start to think about, perhaps as a, with, with the community, start to think about what are the mechanisms that can allow maybe a more diverse audience to live in a place that's so beautiful and that's been so well designed. Maybe a mix of types, and this is from uh, Almere in the Netherlands, also a new town. It's experimented, they're ex constantly experimenting with new housing types. This one is a townhouse slash canal house slash boat house. Um, but um, I, I mean, we can, there's plenty of examples and I think there's very good examples here, but we can bring maybe different types of housing. In another new town in Harlow, they're experimenting with density as well. This is a low density, a fairly low density city. It's a, it's a garden city model, but they're bringing new density and creating landmark buildings that can accommodate you know, more space and, and maybe act as kind of these kind of visual landmarks. 
And I think they're doing, they're taking units and turning them into possibly a change in the land use so that they could be turned into offices at some point. And you could establish this live and work relationship with your own, in your own neighborhood. Imagine what it would be if you could live and work out of your apartment. Well, some of us do already. I mean, I write my papers in my apartment. But I think you can make it more of a, a, a regular thing. And I think you could attract more people in. I'm almost done. I think we need to create spaces that have a multitude of functions inside and outside of buildings. So in my little cheesy diagram, I show what it could be. And I'm really happy to see the heart on top of the library. Because I think I can, th you know, so these are the sacred places. What are the opportunities? These are the community spaces. They don't have, they could be the mailboxes all condensed into one room, a small lounge with Wi-Fi access so the neighbors can actually maybe call, uh, you know, almost like in a dorm setting. But I mean a diversity of programs within buildings and also some unprogrammed spaces so we can actually, because we can predict life in 50 years. And so we can't just design cities on the basis of what we know today. And so maybe the water can help us. There's boats that can be added, and just like the, the sauna can be added to the shoreline. And we can expand, we can add new uses that maybe don't fit into the heart of the buildings, but could fit in this kind of semi-public sort of space. In San Francisco, when they needed parks and they couldn't have space for it, they brought them in with containers. This is from my friend at CMG. Uh, Kevin Conger, they created these parklets that are now extremely popular and there's a land use ordinance now uh, that helps people that want to establish parking or new parks instead of parking. We need to make room for natural processes in everyday life, so bring nature in closer to people. And I think there's a missed opportunity in Seringa to actually create more an ecological friendly sort of environment. The roads take on the middle of the, 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 the space. If we took the cars out, this could be free up, freed up for actually processes for uh, swale, vegetated swales, canals that could actually sort of treat water. And we could work with creating ecotones so that, that there's, there's an opportunity for habitat as well. A lot of what, the, what I see in the plans, see here, it's a lot of hardscape and hard edges that are not very good for habitat. They're not very good for birds and uh, other wildlife. And these are examples from San Francisco, from Treasure Island, a district very similar to uh, in the middle of the Bay Area, which is being redeveloped. And they're actively thinking about urban agriculture and uh, sort of habitat as being integral to the identity of this place. It's, it's, it's essential to the green infrastructure of this place. And in places that already exist, like Park said, this is a 1960s housing development of tall towers. They're bringing urban agriculture and they're linking so you could walk and sip on your coffee while people actually work on their gardens. Not very far-fetched to think about. We need to think about community and I said, and I think I'm gonna end with this one, not just uh, in life and community and not simply as housing. So we need to provide a full range of use, uses and a full range of residents. And so there's this concept of sort of aging in place. How many of us are able, so the more you attach to your neighborhood, the more you want to remain in this neighborhood. You can't really be priced out of your neighborhood. So can we think of opportunities to have this kind of regen, um, sort of regeneration uh, within the building so that people are able to move within the neighborhood in different buildings? At the moment, I think it's challenging, uh, but I think we can think of ways. And if you look at the statistics, this is uh, data from, very, from uh, 2015 in the UK, people, want to live in neighborhoods, sometimes because they grew up there, because it's close to their workplace, because they have their friends and family nearby, because they just love what's the housing that's available to their neighborhood. So let's actually think more, not just uh, at, at sort of providing houses, but let's think of actually providing a sense of community and, and trying to plan for it. And this one is about bringing art, but I think you know, we discussed art so much, and this is just programs in Harlow again, that use you know, Rodin and other main sculptors to sort of activate uh, historical uh, precedents. And we, we need to bring more food, uh, affordable food, into places. This is Portland, Oregon, that has an extensive program of food, uh, food trucks that have changed the look of parking into uh, actually places for very good food. Um, 
And it's interesting to talk about the library. This is an example from Lamasol, Cyprus. I was just there to give a talk. And they have these uh, portable libraries, outdoor public libraries, where you can drop your book if you don't need it. And somebody in that space who's sitting on a bench and wants something to do, they can use that same book uh, that you just brought there. That's easy to do. And participation is part of it. And I think technology can help us, but technology is not enough. And participation is needed because out of participation, we learn how to be better citizens, how to live with one another. And I have to skip, but I want to get to this question. Oh, this is a map of, uh, that I, so we can use technology to actually get feedback from residents. And this is uh, feedback from residents of a new town that tells us about the places they love. And so those are the places then we can start to sort of operate and work on. So what will the residents of Biorvika 50, say 50 years from now? Uh, this is what residents of Harlow, a new town, say 50 years after they move there. The things that they will be sorry to leave behind, which is an indicator of attachment, are friends, communities, families, sculptures, the memories. So with the housing, we need to bring opportunities. We need to build memories. We need to build stories. Thank you very much.